This is ILF Radio, our weekly podcast, where we peek into the soul of Indian heritage with our esteemed guests and listen through the old season walls. For this episode, we have embroidered a piece of Uttarakhand with the threads of Gartangali that stitch together India and Tibet. This ancient trade route in the Nilong Valley was the prime medium of transport for the Jad Bhutia community who acquired a unique identity over a period of this cultural and economic exchange. The history of this wooden bridge needles into the identities of these communities, not only in its physical form, but also through the intangible aspects, folklore and other lesser known stories. And now, let's get weaving. Hi, I'm Priya from India Lost and Found. For this episode, we have Dr. Lokesh Ori with us. Dr. Lokesh Ori is a Dehradun based anthropologist and heritage preservationist. He's also the founder of Been There, Doon That, an educational initiative that works to raise awareness about Doon Valley's social and cultural history through walks, lectures, and workshops. After finishing college, Dr. Ori had a brief stint in the corporate sector in Kolkata. Subsequently, he returned to his hometown and began teaching. Later, influenced by his strong interest in anthropology, he completed his master's degree in sociology. Following that, he received the scholarship for completing PhD at the Heidelberg University. He currently works as the convener for the Uttarakhand chapter of INTAC. Dr. Ori has long advocated against insensitive, and rapid development in Uttarakhand, particularly in the state capital of Dehradun, which has resulted in a reduction in the state's green cover, partial or complete loss of heritage canals and water bodies due to pollution or road construction and poor restoration work on historic monuments. We are here to ask him about a heritage site that is very close to his heart and try to connect the dots of history with future in order to learn how past can inform present strategies in preservation. Let's hear about Gartangali, a wooden skywalk bridge situated in the Long Valley of Turkashi. This trade route not only supported travel to and from Tibet, but also the bridge that facilitated trade with Tibet, which was the valley's main source of income. The bridge was closed after the Indochina War in 1962. The rich cultural wonders and treasures of the entire region surrounding the bridge are precious to the nation's understanding of this region. Take, for instance, the Lal Baba Temple in the Long Valley with its enormous stone manuscripts. What is written on them is unknown. Whether they will ever be deciphered and brought to the attention of the general public is anyone's guess. The area appears to be frozen in time, evolving only through the nature's weathering and whatever it allows and necessitates. Few traces of the trade route remain, the most notable of which is a narrow wooden bridge along the gorge we know as Gartangali. When I envision the valley, I think of all those tall rock faces, one obscure bridge, its glory, and the fact that it's still holding up. Dr. Ori, when you visualize the area, what do you see? Uh, thank you, Priya, for having me on this podcast. And uh, uh, yes, you very rightly mentioned that uh, Gartangali is very close to my heart. It's, it's a space uh, that uh, brings back so much. If you look at the past, if you think about the history, uh, what all has happened in the region is, is quite amazing. So when I visualize uh, Gartangali, I think of uh, caravans passing through, uh, going from Tibet and uh, and coming all the way to Uttarakhand and to the Himalayas in India, uh, passing through these uh, snowbound mountain passes. I visualize the shouts of uh, traders, the shouts of uh, shepherds uh, moving through the pass shouting in different languages, uh, screaming in different languages, uh, Garwali, uh, Tibetan, Kumauni, Pashto, uh, because I'm told that uh, traders from as far as Peshawar would pass through this region and uh, and access uh, 
trade in Tibet. So it was a region of brisk trade. It was a region of pastoralism. In fact, you'll be surprised to know that a lot of the sheep that passed through uh, this region uh, also carried a lot of goods on their backs. So it was not just the wool uh, that they were, uh, they were kept for, but they were also kept for uh, carrying loads. So, uh, and you have to think of this uh, pristine space. You have to think of this beautiful space, which is uh, about 10,500 feet above mean sea level. It's almost like a high altitude desert, like a lunar landscape, uh, some, somewhat like Ladakh. Uh, and there is this precipice, there is this vertical rock face uh, that rises above the Jard Ganga, the river that flows uh, from this valley, uh, the Jard Ganga, which later on joins the Bhagirathi uh, as it comes out of Gangotri. And on top of this vertical rock face with the Jard Ganga looming below, um, flowing like a ribbon, almost looking like a ribbon, as thin as a ribbon, uh, you see this beautiful skywalk, which is carved through the rock face, which is carved right through the rock face for people to access the trade routes to Tibet. So it's a, it's a very vibrant space. It's a very, uh, it's a space where there is a lot of brisk trade happening and, uh, and, and, uh, that is how the space would have looked like at one point in time. Wow, with your words, you've, you've transport, transported me back into time, taken me to the present, of, present condition of the place all in just a few minutes. That's, that's wonderful. And through your answer, I see how much you really fond of that place because one can sense your attachment to it. And Gartang Gali does seem like a place that was, you know, sort of completely full of life at a particular point in time. And talking about um, Gartang Gali, let's hear first about its history. How was it constructed and what significance did it hold for the locals? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the uh, communities that live in the Himalayas, depended on trade. They were nomads, they were transhuman communities. They would uh, move up and down the slopes depending on the weather. And one of the communities that lived, especially in this region, is the Jard Bhutia community. And the Jards, so the entire valley is known as, uh, as I just mentioned, the river is known as Jard Ganga the villages in in the region they are uh, Zhadong uh, and Nilang so the valley itself is known as Lil Nilang valley but the two prime villages in the region they are called Zhadong and uh, Nilang and uh, so uh, they have a very interesting history because these people were Bhutias they were nomads Bhutias are generally nomads they would uh, move up and down the slopes depending on the weather. They are primarily traders and uh, pastoralists uh, and they are cross-border traders. So they would actually go across the borders and, and engage in trade. So uh, this region, the Nelong Valley, uh, where the Gartang Gali is, connected uh, with Tibet through a pass called the Jelukhaga Pass. Jelukhaga is, uh, it, it was a very significant pass uh, where uh, very brisk trade occurred between Afghanistan, India, and the parts of Tibet and China. So from India, uh, you know, the main imports that went into Tibet were cotton, uh, there were stone implements, uh, there were uh, iron implements, utensils, and jaggery perhaps uh, was a very, very significant item because that was the sugar that people in Tibet used in their tea and in, in the food that they ate. And uh, from Tibet, the goods that would come into India were also equally significant. Uh, and, and the most significant goods were salt. Um, 
salt which was rock salt at that point in time borax uh, borax was very significant because it was used for metal working it was meant for smelting of gold there was wool of course the pashmina wool from tibet was in great demand in the markets of europe and one of the primary reasons why the british entered into this region and occupied it even though they were not very keen to uh, come and fight in the mountains they were a little frightened of heights because uh, because the landscape here was quite different from what they had experienced in europe so uh, the jards of this valley they were engaged in trade and uh, the history is very significant because uh, in the border areas uh, especially the border areas of uttarakhand uh, which are uttarakashi and pithoragarh these areas are known as the bhot region of uttarakhand and the people who live in the bhot region are the bhotias so uh, the bhotias as i mentioned earlier engage in trade and uh, and 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 you would be surprised to know that at that point in time uh, the town of uttarakashi was uh, had a different name it was known as balahat it was known as uh, uh, bara would mean big and hard of course we all know means a market so market. it was the large market it was uh, the large market and uh, in the large markets there would there would be great fairs there would be great melas uh, where uh, large scale trading would happen so uh, the jard bhutias were a very significant component of this trade so when you uh, go up the gangotri valley you come to the town of uttarakashi which is balahat and then ahead of balahat is uh, if you keep going on the route above there is dunda a village called dunda so dunda was the winter home of a lot of the jard people during the winter when the passes were snowbound these people would come and live here and many of them would of course also live in uh, arsip uh, the beautiful valley a little above dunda and uh, from harsil this this region the nelong valley is only about uh, 30 kilometers uh, to access so it was a very very significant uh, part of the trade routes in the country and a lot of important items a lot, lot of uh, Uh, the stuff that we people bought and used uh, were uh, were traded from this region. Uh, two of the very important fairs in the region were the Silku Mela, which is still held in in a village called Rathal, which is not very far from the Nelong Valley, uh, and uh, and the Mag Mela of Tarkashi, which is now referred to as the Mag Mela, but it was the great trading fair of the balahat so oh, right. uh, so yeah it's it's uh, caught on to be a, a, of cultural significance of religious significance whereas whereas it began initially as a bazaar yes yes it was a bazaar and it was a huge trading event because that was the time when the when the winter was thawing and and the traders from uh, as far away as afghanistan uh, would come and uh, bring their stuff and then the traders from tibet would also come in and uh, exchange uh, goods so it was a melting pot it was a great congregation it was a great place to be in fantastic i i can almost imagine you know so full of life and so full of activity and and the fact that the bridge is located at the border areas of three countries which is india nepal and china um this must mean so much of integration and fusion of cultures um and um, could you tell us a little bit bit about this melting pot that you talk about and the people who who these people are yes so uh uh as i mentioned earlier the two prime villages in the region they are jadong and uh, nelong and the jadong is the original home of the jard bhutia people so the jard bhutias were the people who controlled trade in this region uh, 
they had a very interesting system with the uh, with the trade because uh, with the tibetan traders they had a system which is uh, referred to as the mitra system so each jad trader would only trade with a particular uh, tibetan trader and they would have these uh, little seals that would uh, that could kind of connect uh, the traders across the border so uh, a jad trader would carry a seal in his hand and and even if he himself were was unable to bring the goods across the border he would send the seal through someone whoever was carrying the goods and on seeing the seal the mitra across the border the tibetan trader would uh, immediately recognize him purchase the goods and and pay the price so, so fascinating so this mitra comes from mitra the friend the friend yeah yeah so it, all across the uh, the nelong valley this term is uh, is used widely and and the system itself is described as the mitra system a lot of the earlier historians in the region have documented this in great detail uh, so uh, the jards are uh, they are uh, as i said a nomadic community they are transhuman in the winters they go up uh, they come to the villages of harsil and bagori and chorpani and uh, during the summer they would uh, try to cross the uh, passes uh, like the jelukhaga pass and go into tibet now the biggest market in the tibet region was uh, uh it, it was spread across the borders uh but there were a lot of uh, the brisk trading uh, that was happening uh, especially in pashmina wool and borax which was uh, a very significant item at that point in time until the uh, the other alternatives chemical alternatives synthetic alternatives were found so the biggest market across the border was a village called Chabrangzong in Tibet. And most of the Jards, uh, they had these dual identities. They had uh, Hindu identities on this side of the border, and they had Tibetan identities on the other side of the border. Uh -huh. uh, they had different names. They had different names. Uh, like uh, a person would have a Hindu name on this side, but the moment he crossed across the border, he would he would acquire a Tibetan name. Oh, so even today, even today in the Jad homes, uh, you can see two shrines. You can see a shrine to the Buddha, and you can see a shrine to the Hindu gods and goddesses. Uh, even the village of Bagori in Harsil, where most of the Jads are now. Uh, confined uh, in a sense because these people were free roaming people they were trading people they would go across the border freely uh, but uh, after the 1962 war with china borders have been shut down and uh, so they have been confined to one side of the border uh, their villages the frontline villages on the on the borders have been uh, evacuated uh, especially the two villages that I've been referring to, uh, Nilong and Zadong. And, uh, and, and uh, the Jad people have no access to these villages, neither do they have any access to trade. So it's a bit of a tragic uh, you know, turn in, in the history of the region, which was quite, uh, uh, quite active at one point in time. I agree. Um, we know that the Jad Bhutiyas were very closely associated with the bridge due to the trading practices. And you've just mentioned how they, they have been affected consequently, um, subsequently after that. Can, can you please elaborate a little more on how their lives and livelihood have changed after the 1962 war? Yeah, so if you... Uh, if you uh, go into the Nilong Valley, where the Gartang Gali, the bridge is, and uh, you uh, you walk next to the Jad Ganga, the river that flows through the valley, uh, you will see uh, a very stark landscape. You will see a landscape that is almost like a high altitude desert. 
like some of the landscapes in Ladakh. So it's very uncanny because right next to the Nelong Valley is the Gangotri Valley, which is which has beautiful pine forests and the Bhagirathi, the Ganga flowing through. Uh, so on one side is this absolutely green valley and then right next to it is a, is a dry uh, valley. But uh, given the dryness, given the azure blue skies, the landscape is equally beautiful. And the frontline villages, a village like Zadong, has been evacuated. It has been, uh, it has been uh, you know, after the 1962 war with China, uh, people have been forced to leave the village. Uh, very interestingly, uh, you know, the people worshipped their deities, people worshipped their gods. And uh, one of the gods uh, that they worshipped uh, was uh, Lal Devta, as you mentioned in your introduction. Now, the Lal Devta is also a very interesting god because he apparently himself has two identities. Uh, so he's worshipped as the Lal Devata, but he's also worshipped as a Devata called Me Parang. So Me Parang is the Buddhist version of the same deity who right. has a temple in the village of uh, Zadong. Now, uh, when when the villages were being evacuated, the people of uh, uh, the Jad people, they went up to their Devatas. Now, all Devatas in the region uh, they communicate with uh, with humans. They have familial relations. So the devatas are not just deities enshrined in temples, but they are also connected with families very closely. And devatas speak through their oracles. They speak through their mouthpieces, which is a human and who gets possessed by the devata. And it is believed that the devata speaks through uh, this human mouthpiece. So when the Jards approached the oracle of uh, Me Parang or Lal Devata, uh, the Devata refused to budge. He said, you may want to go. The government may be forcing you to leave. The military may want you to be not here, but I am not going anywhere. Uh, you can take my sisters, the two Devis that they worship. Uh, so uh, you could take them, but if you still worship me, if you still believe in me, you have to visit me once more uh, every year uh, so that I can meet my sisters. So that uh, small connection, that very, very thin uh, you know, line that connects people to their ancestral village still exists. And once in a year, the inner line permit uh, restrictions are eased and all the jarred people, wherever they may be in the entire world, they try to come and uh, pay their respects to uh, Lal Dev Me Parang, who is still in Jadaw. So the Jards are very, uh, you know, they are Buddhists uh, also in, in, and they are very, very docile people, very beautiful people who are now engaged more and more in uh, making wool products. So they do a lot of very fine, uh, uh, you know, wool products. But most of the other items of trade uh, are, are not, uh, not traded in anymore. So uh, the connection with Tibet is kind of severed, which is, uh, which is a bit of a sad ending because, uh, because this was a cultural hotspot. This was a place where different cultures uh, would confluence, would meet. And now that is not happening any longer. Mm. That's, uh, it's such a fascinating storyline, a fascinating timeline of such opulence and and um, so many things. And then suddenly the valley is empty. If you had to describe a day in Nelong Valley today, how would you see the region and people's lives if the wars had not occurred? Oh, yeah. the uh, So if... Uh, the war had not occurred and the border had not been shut down. Uh, I would imagine that there would still be very brisk trade happening. And of course, uh, uh, tourism would have been the cherry on the cake because uh, how I would wish to, uh, you know, go across the Garthangali and uh, go into this trading village of uh, Chabrangzong 
and from there maybe access Lhasa. To tell you a very interesting story, uh, uh, a prisoner of war. So after uh, during the Second World War, uh, Dehradun was uh, Dehradun had an internment camp. It was a camp for POWs, and uh, one uh, well-known mountaineer uh, called Henrik Harrer, who was an Austrian austria german uh, mountaineer uh, was interred in this camp in Dehradun. Uh, so uh, uh, henrik harrer tried to escape from the camp six times and the sixth attempt was successful and what he did was that he started walking towards the mountains he uh, associated himself with a few uh, pilgrims who were going all the way to gangotri and uh, Henrik Harrer uh, probably would have crossed uh, the Gartang Gali and then entered the Tibetan village of Shabrangzong and, uh, and, and then moved on to Lhasa. So uh, Henrik Harrer's story is very interesting because he managed to walk all the way up to Lhasa from Dehradun. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and Tibet in those times was very, you know, people in Tibet were very suspicious of Westerners of white skinned people and and people and any uh, white skinned person found uh, would have been beheaded uh, straight away oh. but Henrik Harrer was very street smart he had a great presence of mind he managed to escape all the way from Dehradun um, and walked all the way up to Lhasa uh, approached his holiness the Dalai Lama uh, who was also facing the Chinese occupation at that point in time became his tutor and played a very significant role in His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, crossing over and coming to India when the occupation finally happened. Right. So this entire story is, uh, this entire story is, uh, is mentioned in a book, in a famous book called yeah. uh, Seven Years in Tibet, Seven Years in Tibet, which uh, eventually became a very uh, big Hollywood movie where uh, Brad Pitt played the role of uh, Henrik Hara. That's right. So, and uh, it's a very well-made movie, no doubt. Yes, yes. And to think of uh, Henrik Hara walking across the Gartang Gali, uh, going into Tibet, is is uh, gives me goosebumps. It gives me, uh, you know, uh, and and kind of also reminds me of what life would be now if the war had not happened, because there would be lots of adventurers uh, who would want to emulate who would want to uh, do what ha what hara did um, uh, in in those times and and take this route and go into tibet and explore all True. these uh, besides the modern uh, ways of trade that may have taken place there would have been like you say adventurists going maybe uh, on um, on runs and marathons and walks and hmm. things like that yes. and and hmm. the bridge would have contributed to all of this and so yes. the bridge's yes. legacy includes not only the trade it promoted but also these stories and and so many traditions and the folklore some of which you have just mentioned and um, how have these tales now assimilated in the region can you tell us a, a quick folklore associated um, along the area? Yeah. So, uh, so, as I mentioned, the people of the region, they are uh, Buddhist as well as Hindu, and they follow the Pandava ritual. Uh, so, uh, people in the mountains, they believe that the Pandavas are their ancestors. And so, one of the Pandava rituals that the Jad people perform is the ritual of Pano where uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a story about bhim the strong pandava brother marrying hidimba who was uh, who was a daughter of the mountains uh, and and uh, so he married hidimba and according to local beliefs so this this story kind of uh, matches with what happened uh, what happens in the mahabharata epic but also diverges a little bit. And uh, so the locals believe, the Jards believe that Hidimba uh, bore two, uh, two children, two siblings uh, called uh, Babikan and Babiki. 
Now, these two siblings uh, of uh, Hidimba and Bhima, uh, it is believed that they are uh, grazing a rhinoceros in the in the mountains. Now, believe it or not, this region had a lot of the rhinos wow. uh, that have now uh, disappeared over a period of time. And we haven't um, even and, heard of rhinos up there. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But they are they are very much a part of the rituals and the folklore. So, uh, so the rhino is, uh, so the Pandavas after uh, going into exile, walk through the region and, and uh, they see a rhino and they want to hunt it. But uh, it is, it is uh, and, and Bhima is unaware that the rhino belongs to his own children. And then there is a battle between Bhima and his own children uh, in order to save the rhinoceros. At, at the end of the tradition, at the end of the whole ritual performance, which is uh, which is uh, performed every year in in the in the valley, there is a goat sacrifice, and one of the one of the villagers who is possessed by Draupadi uh, emerges from a tent where a goat has been sacrificed, with her lips smeared with uh, uh, the blood of the goat. Which is which again kind of you know connects with the Mahabharata epic where Draupadi had uh, sworn that she would uh, that after her insult in the court uh, right. of Paravas she would uh, satiate her thirst with the with the blood of Dushasana. Right. So the so so these folklores kind of meet and diverge and and create a very interesting. Um, cultural landscape, uh, which is which is so fascinating. It certainly is so fascinating, and um, much more fascinating is how, like you say, that they have converged over so many decades and centuries. But one war, and it's it's gone, or it's going, and it's vanishing, and that's sad. How can we revive Nalong Valley's mm. cultural legacy? So Nalong Valley has. Um, it's it's a very very pristine and beautiful landscape. It has been off limits for people for ever since the war happened. Uh, you need an inner line permit to go into the valley. Uh, I was fortunate enough to to uh, to be given the inner line permit to go and see the the bridge. Uh, the bridge is being restored now, and there is talk that the valley will be uh, you know it'll it'll come off limits. And the inner line permit restrictions will be removed. Uh, now, in order to preserve the legacy, I think the first step that we can initiate is to give the Jard people access to their villages. These villages have been decaying, they have been facing, as you said in the introduction, erosion, uh, forces of nature. So I think we should allow the Jard people to, uh, to you know, kind of restore their culture by by uh, by populating the uh, the their summer homes in in Zadong and Nilong villages uh, they should be allowed to restore their homes and and we should also protect the region from uh, unbridled tourism that that most of our uh, uh, mountain regions are suffering from because today uh, I, I come across villages in Himachal Pradesh, uh, villages in uh, Uttarakhand. Incidentally, this area is also very well connected to Kinnor uh, from the Harsil Valley. The wow. trek all takes almost a week, and and you can you can be in the Kinnor region. So it connects a huge landscape which has kind of you know been shut down because of this war. Once this opens up, there will be huge. Uh, trekking opportunities, there will be huge opportunities for people to explore, but we have to somehow protect the region from, you know, uh, the this crush of tourism, as I say, that people want to uh, post selfies, people want to tell stories on their blogs about these places, but, uh, but, but we need to uh, allow only that many people that a place can carry. So the carrying capacity of the space has to be kept in mind. Um, if the jards uh, are allowed to do their transhumans, if they're allowed to move up and down the slopes as they used to do uh, many, many years ago, I think it will 
do great wonders to restore the cultural uh, landscape to its earlier uh, shape. I agree with and you. Um, really, yeah. yeah, it's it's so important. Yes, and people need to know. Need people need to see this nomadic lifestyle because it it is a very very rich and a very enriching uh, way of life, which uh, most of us settled in the cities have uh, kind of forgotten and can't even imagine <laughs> uh, <laughs> living. <there. laughs> That's true. Dr. Ori, I wish you all the very best for creating this awareness. And I hope that the people understand the value and the, the potential the, the, of this treasure and that Lal Baba um, receives his home back someday. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Priyaji. And thank you, ILF, for uh, allowing me to talk on Nelong Valley and the Jad Bhutia people of uh, Tarkashi. It was great uh, being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely having you here. As for our listeners, tune into ILF Radio. Let India Lost be found. <laughs>